So we have been studying <clears throat> spiritual warfare, and looking into the scriptures and seeing uh, a, a number of truths. Um, just off the top of your head, who is our enemy? What's that? Oh, come on, don't be shy in here. Satan. Okay, who else is our enemy? Ourselves. Ourselves. Who else is our enemy? The world, the culture, the society that, that stands opposed to God. Um, we have looked at knowing ourselves. We've looked at knowing our enemy. We've looked at knowing the battleground. Uh, we've looked at uh, an example from the Old Testament on spiritual warfare. Um, we have started into Ephesians chapter 6. So if you would go ahead and turn there. Ephesians chapter 6. Do you guys want the lights on? It's, it's one of those days that it's like right in between. Ugh. There we go. <clears throat> so Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be here for a few weeks, so... Um, would behoove you to familiarize yourself with this. Um, <clears throat> I, I actually, I struggled a lot this week. I knew I would. I was hoping I wouldn't, but uh, when you deal with topics like spiritual warfare, you get to experience what you're studying and what you're teaching on. Um, last week we talked about what? Truth. truth. <laughs> Having your loins girded with truth. Uh, I, I kind of shared with you that the idea was not a belt like, like we wear today. It was a covering that protected the sensitive areas, the hips and the groin. Okay? Um, but we talked about what that truth was, and um, I, I shared with you, it's in my opinion, okay, this is my belief. I, I don't believe that the truth that Paul is referring to there is this, okay? I believe that comes later when we talk about the sword, okay? And I, I don't see why Paul would, would be redundant. Now, we talked about Paul writing this letter. This is one of the prison epistles. He was in prison in Rome, and there was a guard that was with him day and night, and this guard would be armored as a Roman soldier. So Paul is kind of looking at him as an example of how we are to be armored for the fight. So I'm going to start uh, up here in verse 13. Actually, I'm going to back up to verse 10. We covered 10, 11, and 12 a couple weeks ago, and we're going to be moving forward today. So verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Okay, so now we're set up. We understand everything that follows is predicated on this. Okay, first, whose might is it? God. It's God's might, not ours. Okay, and if you try and fight this battle in your own strength, you're going to fail. Okay? Um, how much of the armor are we supposed to put on? Oh. All of it. Why? So that we can stand against the schemes, the wiles, the plans of the devil. The trickery of the devil. Okay? And where are we waging this battle? Come on, guys, I'm just following down the verses here. This is 12. We're not wrestling in flesh and blood. It's not in this physical realm. Okay? We are fighting spiritual warfare. Now, don't get me wrong. There will be times that that will appear in the physical realm. Okay? But that's the outcome of what's actually going on in the spiritual realm. All right? So, down in verse 13. Therefore, because of all of this that we just talked about, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. 
Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, and I may declare it boldly, as I ought to speak. Okay? So, Paul doesn't do things in half measure. If you notice that about the writings of Paul, it's all or nothing. Okay? And, and true to his, his writing style, Paul is giving us an all or nothing. Now, understanding also that Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I believe that also tells us that God is all or nothing. Okay? So, we have a battle that is being waged against an enemy that is in every way superior to us, but is in no way equal to or superior to our God. Okay, so we need to understand the principle here is that we cannot fight him of our own strength. That's why Paul starts this off by saying, you've got to be strong in his might, not yours. Now last week we talked about truth. I believe truth to be the truth revealed of who you are. Okay? It's, it's looking at things the way they really are. Examining yourself in the light of God's word and not deceiving yourself and not being open to hypocrisy. It's, it's the truth behind the mask that we so often wear around each other. Okay? Who am I really? All right? Now, none of us is perfect. None of us are even close to perfect. Thank God for the cross whereby we will be counted perfect. We are counted perfect, not because of us, but because of him. So the belt of truth, I think Paul specifically starts with this because you have to understand truth in order for the rest of this to work. Okay? So, after the belt of truth, we are to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Um, Josh, do you still have the picture from last week? If you could put that up for me, please. So the belt of truth tells us that we don't want to look like, we don't want to act like, we don't want to smell like a Christian. We want to be a Christian. Now, you see that the, the breastplate is covering the chest all the way down to the belt. And on the back side is another piece that is, is uh, shaped to the body, and it covers the back. Okay? The breastplate of righteousness. Now, Paul is looking at this Roman soldier, and that's why we're looking at this, uh, because that's probably what Paul was looking at. Um, it was designed specifically to prevent a blow to... Hmm. Your heart. Okay? It's to protect your heart. Also, the, the internal organs in your torso. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the word that, that Paul is using here is thorax. Okay? The breastplate of righteousness is the thorax of righteousness. It's, it's covering your thorax. Um, Polybius writes that the breastplate was a bronze plate measuring a span every way which they wear on their breast and call a heart guard. Okay? Yeah, a heart guard. So not only are we to set truth about ourselves, but we are to guard our hearts with righteousness. So I was, I was really struggling with this message because I felt like even this morning when I got up, there's just something not, I'm missing something. And I was praying this morning, and it was one of those prayers where I was really distracted. I know you guys don't have those prayers, okay? But I was distracted this morning. I had some things going on. I had a, a, a um, kind of a cruddy week. Um, 
A lot of it had to do with truth. Now, truth can work one of two ways. A lot of times we think of ourselves more highly than we ought, right? Okay, that's pride. And we go, oh yeah, I got this. Gotta, you know, if I need some help, I'll let you know. Other times, we think less of ourselves than we ought. Okay? Remember when we talked about knowing yourself? Outside of God, there is no good in you. But from God come all good things. And so if you are in Christ, then immediately the enemy starts setting about against you lies trying to convince you that you are not who God says you are. Okay? Now, for the first part of the week, I struggled with who does God say I am? I, I, I got to tell you, I was really down. I was frustrated. I, to be honest, uh, I came to prayer Wednesday. I went to discipleship Wednesday morning feeling like I don't even know why I'm doing this. God, I, I am not seeing any fruit of this. Why, why do you have me doing this? Get somebody that's more eloquent. Get somebody that's got more together than I got. God, I don't know why I'm here. Um, and then I, I got an email from Mike Kidder. And he was talking about um, Leanne and, and Cindy are coming up and the concerns he has because he's going to be at home without Cindy with six kids. <laughs> he is asking for donations of duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, they have different rules and beliefs. But Mike was sharing with me, because you guys remember Mike when he was here. Uh, I had a conversation with Mike when we were standing back there uh, trying to clear up the, the drainage ditch. And we had our arms up to here in the pipe and yanking and pulling and it wasn't moving. And Mike was sharing with me that God was calling him to go to Belize. I'm thinking, God's calling you to go to Belize. You just showed up at church not too long ago. <laughs> And, and then he starts sharing with me the things that God had put on his heart. Well, over the course of time, we had a number of discussions. And, and as they were gearing up to leave, and God just opened doors miraculously for them to leave. And I believe God is going to open doors miraculously for the McDaniels to leave as well. That's hard to say because we're taking people that God has brought into our church and become a part of our family, and, and they're going out. Okay? It's kind of like um, you know when your kids come of age and they move out of your house. It's kind of the same feeling. Um, but I, I really believe that God is going to do this for the McDaniels. And, and Mike was sharing with me. He says, uh, yeah, you know, I'm just going down there to support to the mission team that's down there. They're going down to a missions compound. And he said, you know, I'm going to keep their, their vehicles running and their, their machines running. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be kind of behind the scenes, man. And I said, I don't think so. He said, what do you mean? I said, I think God's going to have you doing a lot more than what you expect. He said, I wouldn't be surprised at all if God has you teaching and preaching. And he goes, not me. <laughs> and you know Mike standing this tall going, not me. I'm not going to argue with Mike. <laughs> I put it out there and I'll let God deal with it. So as many of you know, um, about four weeks ago, Mike and Cindy were put over uh, the church out of 8 Mile, the area that they live outside of Belize City. And Mike is not only the preacher, He's also the worship leader. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. Because God, and, and this is what struck me, because this is something that I say a lot, and Mike said it back to me. He said, this just goes to prove that God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. Okay? And I, I started thinking that, and it, and it kind of stinks when somebody throws right back at you what you told them. It wasn't so bad coming from Mike, but when your kids do it, <sighs> yeah. So, the belt of truth. I had to start looking at what God has said about me. Now, ultimately, if you guys are looking at me to be an answer to anything going on in your life, you're in trouble. My job is to be a giant neon sign pointing the way to God. Okay? And to kind of, I'm the sheep with the bell on. Now, I don't know a lot about sheep. I know sheep are smarter than cows. You, oh, you know how I know? 
Because when the sun is out, the sheep go in the shade. And when it rains, they go under shelter. Cows just stand there eating, looking dumb. <laughs> All right? Now, I don't know what else there is to the intellectual life of an animal, but that kind of indicates to me that sheep have a little bit more brains than cows do. Now, I know nothing about farming, so, you know, if you want to talk later, I'm sure she will fill you in on everything you need to know about cows and sheep. So, um, having to put on the belt of truth, I have to see what God says I am. My job as, as the pastor is to be the, the sheep with the bell on, the one that leads the flock after the true shepherd. Okay? And the bell lets the shepherd know where the flock is and if the flock is in trouble. All right? Now, I'm not in any more lofty position than you are. As a matter of fact, the way that I see New Testament scripture laying out leadership, if anything, I'm a bigger servant than you are. Okay? Um, this, this is not a position in which to take pride because I haven't attained anything of my own self. So, if that is the case, then whether I succeed in my eyes or not really is irrelevant, isn't it? Isn't it? Because I don't have to be a success in my eyes. I have to be a success in his. And in order to be a success in his eyes, all I have to do is what he's given me to do. And trust that he will help me, he'll equip me to do the job. Okay? Uh, you guys wouldn't believe how many times uh, one of you will come to me with something going on. And in my brain I'm screaming, Oh God, help! I don't know what to do! All the while trying to look, you know, Wise. <laughs> and God is faithful. You know, a, a lot of times he will speak a verse or a passage to me that I can, I can relay. A lot of times he gives me just a word that will put you in the right direction. A lot of times he give, tells me something to tell you to, to, to go figure out on your own. Um, so truth. But today we're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. Um, what, what is righteousness? What, what does it even mean? Uh, before, before you answer, um, I, I kind of had a weird idea about righteousness. I kind of equated righteousness equals holiness. And, and they do go together, but they're not the same. Um, the, the word that Paul is using here in the Greek is dekai osune, and it means just or righteous. It is the fulfillment of justice. It is the understanding that you will conform to a higher authority. You are going to alter your life to live according to a higher authority. So if you're a Christian... That higher authority is who? Jesus. God. Okay? You are agreeing that you are going to live according to what God wants. Okay? Now, how do we know what God wants? Well, primarily, here. We read the Word. That fan is really problematic. It keeps moving my notes. If you're not a Christian, then who is your authority? Well, it kind of depends where you are, but there's governing authorities pretty much everywhere. You know, in, in our country, we've got local authorities, we've got state authorities, we've got federal authorities. There, there's a, a hierarchy of authority in our, our country. And if God isn't your authority, you still have an authority. Okay? So, righteousness says that you are conforming your life to the authority over you such that you become right in standing before that authority. Okay? It's being justified. Okay? Now, for the Christian, there's, there's a whole twist to this 
Because before the Christian, we have to stand before God absolutely righteous and in complete conformity with everything that he has called of us. Can any of us do that? No. Not, not, we cannot do that in our own ability whatsoever. That, that was the whole purpose of the law was to make us aware of our desperate need for somebody to bridge the gap between us and God. Because we couldn't approach Him on our own because we can't be good enough. Okay? So, right there, when we're talking about the breastplate of righteousness, we know it cannot be self-righteousness. What is our righteousness before God? As filthy rags. Yeah. Filthy rags. Now, you might think of, you know, a rag you use to wash your car. I think of the rags that used to be diapers. Okay? Um, my parents were good friends with some people in Florida. This was before I was born. But the, the people in Florida had a rule. When their baby would soil the diaper, they would put it in the toilet. And whoever had to use the bathroom next had to clean the diaper. It did not take the husband long to start using my parents' bathroom. Okay? Because then he never got to see the diaper. He never had to clean it. That's the filthy rags that we have to offer God. That's our righteousness. Okay? It's something nobody wants. Okay? So, if we need to bridge the gap. We can't do it on our own. Who can? Well, only God can. And God chose to do that through the person, the God person of Jesus Christ, who, although suffering every temptation that we suffer, you ever feel like you're alone in your temptation? You ever feel like it's just you? It's not. Okay, God is right there with you. Jesus has experienced the same temptation. And even though he experienced all of those temptations, he did not sin. Okay? So, God made a way that we can come before him, we can cross that gap with a righteousness not of our own. Okay, so understanding righteousness is justification. We've been justified before the authority over us. We're conforming to the authority over us. If then God has said you have to be perfect as he is perfect and holy as he is holy, how then do we approach God? <clears throat> Justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? So you have to have an understanding of what this does. Because see, the, the breastplate of righteousness shows you, shows the enemy that your heart is guarded not because of anything that you have done, but because of what God has done. Whose armor is this anyway? God's armor. Fitted specifically to you. Okay? It's fitted specifically to you. Now, I, I share with Christy a lot that sometimes when we get bowled over, we almost always get bowled over right after a huge success. Does that ever happen to you? Yes. You, you, you have a victory, you've seen God move, and you've celebrated. And I, I think oftentimes, and I, I've looked for this and I cannot find it, I know it was in either ancient Rome or ancient Greece, uh, there was a, a, a huge battle that was waged, and the victorious army chased the other army off the field. Well, as part of their thing when the victory was won, they would loot the spoils and they would pillage the other people's stores and they'd drink and have a party. And Well, what happened was this whole thing was planned, and when they left, they actually just went around behind the hill and they waited until these guys started drinking and getting happy. They took off their armor and laid the armor down because the battle was done. Was the battle done? No, because the other army came back in the night and slaughtered the entire opposing force. And I think as Christians, we do this a lot. Okay? We see a victory and we're like taking off the helmet. Woo! Yeah, we got victory. Let me shield. We throw the sword and hope it sticks in the ground, not in our head, because we took the helmet off. <laughs> and we take off the breastplate, we take off the shoes, we take off the belt, and we start living it up and partying. And what happens? The enemy comes in, wham, and knocks us over. Why? Because we're unprepared. 
Now, did you notice the words that Paul was using in this passage? Remember I told you he's an all or nothing kind of guy? So how often are we supposed to wear the armor? Always. Always. How much of the armor are we supposed to wear? Always. Always. All of it. All of it. Because see, this battle does not end in this life. Okay? Whether it be unto death or unto Jesus returning, this battle will be waged during the entirety of our lives because we have declared ourselves enemies of the prince of the air of this world. And he doesn't take that lightly. You become a traitor to him. Traitors are killed. And he's going to do everything he can to steal, to kill, and to destroy you. Okay? But what do we have guarding our heart? One of the things that I fall prey to is condemnation. And I know you guys don't do this. Okay. Yeah, no. I know you do because some of you have shared with me. But the enemy comes against you and he starts telling you, he's telling you truths insofar as what you might be thinking, what you might have done, or what you should have done. You should have shared the gospel with that person. There's a wide open door there, and you blew it. Oh, God is not pleased with you. Big black mark on your record. Now we start falling under this, right? Or, oh, 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 you did that sin again. Ah, uh, yeah, gotcha again. And we start coming under condemnation, right? Well, but whose righteousness is it? that we have. We have the very righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that he became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Now think about this for a minute, okay? Because if you have the very righteousness of God if you are accounted righteous before him with his righteousness, not your own, and if his sacrifice is paid for all sin, past, present, and future in your life, then Romans 8.1 really takes on a significant meaning to you. Because Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore... Now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? When you put on the breastplate of righteousness, not of your own, of God, it is His righteousness, it is His holiness, it is His purity that you stand before Him and He sees. Not yours, His. So when you stand before him dressed in robes of white, totally spotless, you are blameless before God. Do you understand that? Now, don't forget, the devil is our accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. And he is right there too, listing off all of the things that you did wrong. He blew it here, he blew it here, he blew, did you see that thought, God? Did you see that thought? When that guy cut him off on the road driving a tractor, did you see what he did? He thought horrible things. But also standing before God is Jesus Christ, who is what? Our intercessor, our mediator. He is the one who says, no, no. This one's mine. Those sins, those are paid for. Paid in full. Price is paid. Nothing is owing on Len's account. Nothing is owing on your account. You stand before him with his righteousness. So when the enemy starts coming against you and starts whispering those lies, and telling you, and, and even if those lies are truth, they're only truth relative to who you were before Christ, right? Because in Christ, even that truth becomes a lie, right? 
right? Okay, well, yeah, I sinned, I blew it. I'm not perfect, I messed up. But you know what? I am righteous before God because he has paid my price. He has paid my way. So, yeah, I made that mistake. I confess. What does confess mean? Acknowledge. You, you agree with. Okay? Yeah. I confess before God, I screwed up. I messed it up. I blew it. God, I'm agreeing with you. I should not have done this. So I make my confession, and if we confess, he is what? Faithful and what? Just to forgive us our sins. See how this, this whole thing is working together? He gives us righteousness whereby we are justified. So when the enemy seeks to come against us, God is just to forgive us because the price is paid. We owe nothing. Hey guys, if that doesn't get you going, you're hopeless. Before God, you owe nothing. You are free. And when the enemy comes against you, you have authority and power to say no. No. I do not accept this. Because God has said, I am righteous. God has declared me sinless. God has made it such that I am now his child and not yours. You have been given that authority. Now, we start putting on this armor. When we put this armor on, what is the position we're supposed to be in? Stand. 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 We stand with feet firmly planted. Okay? Unmovable, unshakable. The enemy is going to do everything he can to get you off your game. I talked a little bit about this last week. I've got to share it with you again. We are not alone in this fight. Not only is God with us, but God has set us in a body whereby we are covered. Our backs are protected. Our sides are defended. We have people that will come alongside of us and hold us up when we are weary. That will take our place in the fight. And that's why it's so dangerous when people say, I don't need to go to church. Okay? Okay? How then can we support each other? How then can I know how I can support you? If you're not here and I have no contact with you, we can't help. We can't help. Even, even if we blow it, even if we, we mess it up, God has established it to work this way, not this way. Okay? We work together. We live in a country and in a time that is unlike the vast majority of the world. We have freedom to do this. Uh, we don't even understand how precious that is. To be able to come together openly and worship God and sing his praises, to not just uh, own a Bible, but to read it out loud and share with one another, that we can go out on the street and preach this word. And only sometimes get arrested. <laughs> and I think that will be happening more and more often, personally. And I say great. Great. Because quite honestly, I'm sick and tired of looking around at the pathetic, lazy church in America. Yes. Uh, really. Really. If you can't motivate yourself to get involved in the fellowship with the body when times are this good, 
How are you ever going to motivate yourself when times are bad? How are you ever going to be disciplined enough to get together and meet with the body as God has required when it's your life on the line? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't believe you have to be here every Sunday. But I believe every Sunday you should be somewhere worshiping taking that time to be in the fellowship of God. Hearing his word expounded to you. Lifting his name up in praise, adoration. Fellowshipping with the saints. Okay? I, I, I don't have any plan. It is not my plan to grow this church. I trust God with that. My plan is to grow the kingdom of God. I want to take goats and see God miraculously convert them into sheep. And then let God choose which flock, which sub-flock that they are going to be a part of. I trust God with that. But, but did you see what the key component there is? is? Is we have to be the ones getting out there, taking the word out there, to the goats so that they can see that there are sheep. That's why we're different. Um, I, I told you guys a few weeks ago I started a fast of media. And, and I was not on Facebook. Uh, people kept sending me messages on fa Facebook. First, I don't have Messenger on my phone or my iPad, so when people send me messages, I just kind of look at it and go, it's red. Second, um, I, I really, especially Facebook, you know, stuff was going on in the news, but then on Facebook I was, I was heartbroken by some of the things that I was seeing, not just going on in our country, but the reaction of Christians to it. And I was angered by some of the things that, that uh, people who profess to be fellow believers in Christ were saying that are just so horrifically based, not on scripture and, and I, I was I found myself getting tense and frustrated and angry and God said put it down <coughs> which close it put it down leave it alone and I thought it was going to be for a week and, and uh, it went a little bit longer than a week and I think it should have gone longer than it did because last night I got on and one of the first things I saw <coughs> down I went it was a, a, a brother in Christ and talking about something that I just, I go. And I, I struggle and I, I, okay. So if you need to contact me, don't use Facebook. Okay. Text me, call me, come to my house and visit me. Call me and have me come to your house to visit you. However it works. Okay. And, and if you're like Dave, there's a pattern. If you don't reach me on my phone, what do you do, Dave? Call Christie's phone. Okay? And if she doesn't answer, call the house. And don't give up. Okay? There's a lot of times when I'm meeting with someone or if I, if I have something going on, I mute my phone and I put it to the side. Then there's times when I'm riding on the lawnmower and I don't even hear the thing. Okay? So don't give up. All right? My point is this, whenever the church has suffered persecution, it's also suffered <laughs> growth. At first, there's a falling away. Okay? Now, uh, I don't like onions, but I'm going to use an onion illustration. I know enough about onions that you've got to get rid of that stuff, the papery stuff on the outside before you serve it. I don't know why. It's not going to make the taste any worse. <laughs> but for courtesy, you're supposed to get rid of that papery stuff. And, you know, I, I still have not figured out exactly where you're supposed to stop. You just keep peeling and peeling and peeling. You end up with the thing this big. You're like, oh, look, here's your onion. Okay? But it's, it's just like that, that, that garbage around the outside. 
The church has to get rid of that stuff. It has to peel that stuff away. God pulls that away. Why? The scripture says that they came out from us. Why? They, us. they were not of us. They weren't ours. They were wolves in sheep's clothing. And they will fall away. The righteousness that God asks you to bear on your chest to protect your heart is His righteousness. It's what He has gifted to you. And the only way that you can ever access that is just by accepting it. Okay? You can't earn it. You can't make a trade for it. You can't barter. It, it, it's just, it, it's a gift. He says, here, I've made it. It's yours if you want it. Take it. And then it's up to you to take it. Okay? So, truth, we have to be open and sincere about who we are and what God has done. Righteousness, we have to see, in order to really have truth, we need to understand that the righteousness is not ours. And that's perfect. That's what we want, because if we have to stand before Him in our own righteousness, yeah, that's bad news. Because we have no righteousness. Okay? You mean all those times you helped a little old lady across the street? That they're not going to impress God. Okay? There's not really a warmer or less warm place in hell. You know? There's dark or dark. That's, that's it. Okay? So, take the gift... As Steve was sharing, the, the vision, the, 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 the majesty, the splendor, the awesome authority and power that God just radiates because that's what he is. The love that he pours out to his people. He has made a way that we can stand before him absolutely righteous, with no sin. <coughs> okay? Price is paid. Everything's covered. Father, we bless you. I thank you, God, that I do not have to stand before you in my own righteousness. Father, you have covered me. You have purchased me. You have redeemed me. You have given me new life. You have sealed me unto yourself with your Holy Spirit. You live and make your home inside of me. And Father, where you are, there is authority and the enemy has no power. I thank you, Father, that you have given to us a righteousness that makes us stand pure before you. You have justified us. Help us, Father, to live each day more and more in submission to your will, more and more aware of of what that will is. Help us, Father, to be people that are bold on your behalf, that we would fear nothing. Help us be lights in this dark world. We bless you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>